Good evening, hushlings, and welcome. I present your preceptors to the underbelly of the void, the whispers of conjecture, and the known of the unknown. Thus begins the conclave of the Hush Hush Society. Hello again, hushlings. I'm Declassified Dave. And I'm Mystery Mike. And as always, we're joined by our partner in crime, Slick Frank Sanders. What is up, guys? Slick Frank Sanders here. How we doing, hushlings? Welcome to another debriefing of the Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour. How we feeling, boys? The first of the new year. Or no, no it's, second it's of the, the second. new year. <laughs> <laughs> 2021 is uh, is turning out to be like a 2020 part two. Part two? Yeah. <laughs> Jan December. It's December 38th. Yeah. Uh, December fuck. 38th, 2020. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gotta make the most of it. Take it for what it is. Our second debriefing of 2021. We're trying to put 2020 behind us. 2021 so far is just the Jaws theme repeating over and over <laughs> again. <laughs> Last debriefing, we dove deep into the Bohemian Grove and its club that's associated with the Grove itself. An elitist group of high-ranking people that do weird culty type shit in the woods. I just want to say thank you really quick uh, to someone on Twitter who dropped us a little WikiLeaks link to Bohemian Grove's 2018 guest list. Yeah, shout out to that guy. It was cool looking through that with you, checking out some of those names. We can repost it on our Twitter and our social media so you can check out who uh, the likes of people that showed up to the Bohemian Grove. I'm sure some were pretty uh, surprising and I'm sure some were not. Well, it's it's strange because we had like a couple particular names in mind that were like, yeah, these guys definitely attend these ceremonies and shit and we're looking for their names and they're just nowhere to be hmm. seen. But like we said, maybe maybe there's names that just don't go listed, you know? Most likely. People hmm. that just pay a little bit extra. There are a lot of billionaires on that list, though. Uh, yeah. That episode was actually a lot of fun. Like that, there was a lot of stuff that I learned going through that episode cremation of care moloch odd lots of different things this debriefing for debriefing 15 we are dressing in black as frankie says dapper in fact we are doing the men in black But before we get neuralized, let's jump into the social medias. You can reach us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also find us on YouTube, where we post all the audio for every episode that we do, up to and including this one. You can find us on Instagram, where we are memeing it up, doing a a great social service for all of you. You can also find us at Hush Hush Apparel, where one day, very soon, In the near future, there will be threads that you can wear to show how much you belong to the secret society of the Hush Hush. Maybe 2020.2? It's going to be a (laughs) dapper fucking No more 2020s. And you can also reach out to us through our email. If you have any research that you would like us to take a look at, if you have any topics that you would like to see us cover this episode in fact was a suggestion by a hustling we are looking into the men in black today thank you for reaching out to us and suggesting the topic so we've been led to believe through movies and pop culture that the men in black are quirky diverse protectors of earth Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones had us fall in love with these representatives of an entity above government oversight The truth of the MIB is far more sinister and deadly. The MIB are reported to be agents of a secret government agency, which agency is exactly unknown, dressed in all black suits. Hey, what is that, men's warehouse? You're going to like the way you look. (laughs) You're going to like the way you look. Our next sponsor, yeah. Men's Warehouse. Yeah, yeah, Men's Warehouse, thank you. Thanks to the Men's Warehouse for giving us 12 <laughs> exact all-black suits for this episode. Dressed in all-black suits, these men would show up after UFO witnesses would come to light. They often threatened and harassed witnesses or UFOlogists to keep their story to themselves and out of the media. In some cases, even assassinating those who refused to stay quiet. Men in Black are featured in UFOlogy and UFO folklore, 
In the 1950s and the 1960s, ufologists began to fear that they would be subject to retaliation for discovering the existence of extraterrestrials and especially UFOs. I have a question. Yes. Mm-hmm. 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 Everybody's heard about that 180-day thing in the stimulus bill or whatever whatever the hell we, we just dealt with. Yeah, the 180-day mm-hmm. disclosure. The yeah. countdown. So what are the men in black going to do after that? I, they're all going to go on to unemployment and collect 600 extra dollars a week. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? It was just something I was thinking about. It's a valid question, Dave. Yeah, if we're going to disclose aliens and extraterrestrials. That just opens up a door to another question. Are they really disclosing aliens? Like, I'd love to believe that, but are they Are they really? Do you honestly believe that a secret shadow government or secret space program is going to divulge all its information to the American public just because it says it in some relief bill? That's what I'm saying. Like, I'd really love to believe that, but I don't know if I'm sold on it. So I don't know if the men in black are going to be jobless anytime soon. (laughs) Most likely not. As we've mentioned, the men in black are dark figures dressed in all black that show up after UFO sightings. They almost always wear black suits and hats with dark sunglasses. Hushlings. Sunglasses are coming. And they drive black cars and arrive in groups of two or three. Some describe them as having strange appearances, sometimes with supernatural features like glowing eyes and strange complexions. They are often menacing in demeanor, described as cold, expressionless, and unfriendly. They have overly precise speech, odd expressions, and laughter at inappropriate times. Some witnesses recall them as appearing to have trouble breathing. Weird. Mm. That description, you know what picture came to mind? You know who came to mind? Whose description literally fits all of that? Mark fucking Zuckerberg at Congress. (gasps) Yeah, dude. Yes. It's literally Mark Zuckerberg. (laughs) Not saying that he's men in black, but... uh... He could be a really shit public speaker. (laughs) Yeah, I guess. (laughs) He's just bad at playing human beings. I'm terrible Buys in the front first of set of human clothes he sees. Guys, if you're on our Facebook page, make sure to avoid the Zuctilian fact checkers. <laughs> <laughs> the interrogation of the witness begins immediately, and the men in black already know all of the details of the sightings. If there were any photos taken of the sighting, they take the film. Any evidence is taken away from the witnesses. They tell the witnesses to cooperate and to consider this event as if it never happened, often saying to do it for your country or for the human race. Before they leave, they remind the witness not to tell their story. If the witness is a ufologist, they tell them to abandon all investigations immediately. This is often where the threats and harassment comes in. In 1947, Harold Dahl claimed to have been warned not to talk about his UFO sighting on Maury Island by a man in a black suit which comes as the first mention of the MIB. Dahl and co-worker Fred Chrisman claimed they were harbor patrolmen on a boat near Maury Island in Puget Sound. Puget Sound is beautiful, by the way. If you've ever been like Seattle, it's gorgeous. They saw six donut-shaped objects in the sky. According to the men, one of the objects dropped from the sky in fire, and a substance that resembled lava or, quote, white metal, fell onto the boat, which broke Charles Dahl's arm, Harold's son, and sadly killed the family dog. Oh, Damn, rip. Sucks. So you're trying to tell me this molten white metal falling from the sky killed this dog but only broke some dude's arm? Did the dog yeah. melt? Well, I, that's a weird... Do you think it hardened when it like came into the atmosphere? There wasn't a whole lot of talk of how the dog itself died but i'm guessing if it was some sort of molten piece of metal yeah i'm sure it shot right through it or something yeah if, if it's enough force to break somebody's arm I, I could see that but i also wonder if this white metal was lava like as they say mm-hmm. and it fell onto the boat was it melting through the deck of the boat was it, it like what kind of damage was done to the boat itself? Because that in itself would be enough evidence that the entire thing took place. Yeah. It's just like these big melted holes through the hull of the ship. It's hmm. very vague. That's odd. Yeah. Dahl also claimed he was later approached by a man in a dark suit and told not to talk about the incident. Kenneth Arnold was contacted and told Dahl and Chrisman's story. Arnold 
was an aviator who had also witnessed a UFO activity. Arnold was convinced by the story and contacted an Air Force intelligence officer who flew in from California. In July of 1947, two Army A-2 intelligence officers showed up in Puget Sound. After leaving in their B-25, they flew in B-25 bombers? That's pretty badass. Oh, yeah. <laughs> After leaving in their B-25s the next day, the plane caught fire and crashed, killing both officers, further stoking the conspiracy flame. The FBI proceeded to investigate this case and said that Chrisman and Dahl sightings were a hoax. In their files, they noted that Dahl stated that, and I quote, If questioned by the authorities, he was going to say it was a hoax because he did not want any further trouble over the matter, end quote. The files also detail alternate stories communicated by Chrisman and Dahl to local newspapers and say that they contacted a variety of publications, quote, in the hope of building up their story through publicity to a point where they could make a profitable deal with Fantasy Magazine, end quote. These guys got threatened and now they're like going public like every avenue. <laughs> like... Yeah, fuck it. Why not? <laughs> it is kind of weird looking at this doll and Christmas story because on one end you have the introduction of the men in black and them pretty much being told to keep their story hush hush <laughs> but you also have these a2 intelligence officers that showed up and these officers hear the story of doll and Christmas and then go and take a plane the next day and the plane crashes that right there i think is the most notable part of the story and that i think is the most suspect part of the story why not just kill doll and Christmas right at the get why wait for them to tell somebody and then kill off whoever the fuck they told? Maybe because Dahl and Chrisman had already told local authorities. They had already told people in the Puget Sound area. Oh, yeah. If you go and you kill the two people that are saying that they saw UFOs, then that further only shows that maybe they were Guilt. trying to be silenced or... Yeah. If you tried to kill these people, then, then it just shows that they might have been right and been telling the truth about their story. I don't know. Uh, it's 1947, so, you know, uh, these guys are just literally going through newspapers and telegraphs and word of mouth. There's no physical proof. It's just kind of them talking. And then the possible coincidental event of those guys dying in a plane crash. Yeah. There had to have been some sort of physical evidence. Like I said before, you have the molten metal that fell onto the ship. You have Dahl's son who had a broken arm, the dog is dead. What explanation do we have for that? Is there evidence maybe that Dahl's son went to a hospital the following day or the family dog had a, you know, like there's got to be some sort of either paper trail or evidence trail to either back up or destroy this story. If the story is valid and there is that evidence or was that evidence, if the men in black are who, what they come off to be as, you would think they'd clean up all of that evidence pretty well if they're really trying to conceal this shit. I don't know if that means they could clean up a shipwreck or erase medical records, but I wouldn't put it off the table. Not at all. I would think anything that leaves a paper trail, they would probably be able to destroy pretty easily. Yeah. UFOlogist John Keel has argued that some men in black encounters can be explained as just everyday mundane events that saw these men in black as more than they actually were. In his 1975 book, The Mothman Prophecies, Keel tells of a late night outing in 1967 rural West Virginia where he was taken for a man in black while searching for a phone to call a tow truck. Alternatively, Keel was stated as saying UFO intelligences are not simply extraterrestrials but quote, ultra-terrestrials, entities from unimaginable other dimensions of reality, and they do not like humans. Human beings, Keel Thunders, are quote, like ants, trying to view reality from very limited perceptive equipment. We are biochemical robots, helplessly controlled by forces that can scramble our brains, destroy our memories, and use us in any way they see fit. They've been doing it to us forever, end quote. What? <laughs> he's a ufologist and he kind of discounts the whole men in black thing 
On the other hand, she's also talking about how either the men in black or visitors that we have on the planet Earth are not just extraterrestrials. They're what he calls ultra terrestrials. So we think so plainly on kind of a 2D or 3D board that there's aliens and we think of little green men. But to him, you know, an ultra terrestrial is something beyond our imagination, something that is so dark, for lack of a better word, evil. So you're talking like a hyperdimensional being, though. Pretty much, yeah. Something that it lives on Earth's plane, but not in the view of our perception. Outside of the three or four dimensions, if if that's what you want. So you're getting into some freaky deaky paranormal stuff at that point, but... I, I believe in that shit, and I, I think that's interesting, ultra-terrestrials. I've never heard of that. I've always considered shit like that to still be extraterrestrials. I like that term. To also put it out there... John Keel was not just a ufologist, he was also a demonologist. So really? a lot of yeah, so a lot of his when he had talked about extraterrestrials or UFO sightings or anything like that, he also equated it a lot to maybe they're not aliens, maybe they are demons. Maybe they are some sort of evil entity from another dimension and his UFO stories and his extraterrestrial stories very much were centered around darkness and entities that we can't even comprehend as seeing us as just nothing like something they can just stomp on and we'd be done i can kind of subscribe to that you know i, I feel like in a certain aspect some of the things that you see whether if you are talking like ghost stories or seeing something paranormal, are you actually seeing something that is a human being in the past in their consciousness? Or are you seeing something from a whole different plane of existence? Or are you actually seeing an alien in your realm just appearing as a human to make you not freak the fuck out? That's an interesting one, man. <laughs> That's something that, that we had all discussed in an earlier episode, is that maybe the existence of ghosts and other paranormal entities and stuff like that are maybe not humans of the past, like you said, maybe they are another multi-dimensional entity or a multi-dimensional extraterrestrial so gotta understand that we only see in in 3d and 2d like that's all we see and there are multiple dimensions beyond that it's not beyond reason to look at this situation and and say well maybe we've been interpreting ufo and alien sightings in a completely wrong manner I feel like that's a really consistent theme or consistent way of looking at it, especially when it comes to people that are open-minded to aliens, yet very religious. Um, hmm. I'm not sure exactly how religious this John Keel guy was, but if he was a demonologist or whatever, right? He had to have some sort of religious aspect to him. Yeah, there's a cross-section there, obviously. Yeah, I, I know a couple of people that are wicked religious and are either just now recently becoming a bit more open-minded to the idea of aliens or even a, a couple years ago, you know, having conversations and the topics definitely overlap. I just feel like somebody who looks at one or the other, whether it be these dark interdimensional beings or whether it be spaceships in the sky, most people wouldn't try to overlap the two and, unless they had that kind of religious background. It may actually be flesh and blood extraterrestrials. I think as human beings, we, not to dive too much into it, but I think as human beings, we tend to equate things that we see on a rational plane. So if you are a deeply religious person, you try to equate things that you can't, under, that you can't understand or things that you can't explain to being some sort of religious or holy, sacred type of experience. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, and if you're more of a science-based person and you're more of, you know, you see things from a scientific point of view, maybe you look at it as, well, how could we be alone in the universe and there's obviously other beings. I think when it comes down to this type of stuff, a lot of people have to just relate it to what they know and what they believe. There is also the story of Albert K. Bender of Bridgeport, Connecticut in 1952, Bender created the IFSB, or the International Flying Saucer Bureau, which was an immediate success, dispersing a newsletter worldwide to roughly 2,000 members. Damn, dude, that's... 
we're all from Connecticut. We had no, I had no idea that 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 dude did that. Nope. We gotta reach two thousand members within a year. We're, we'll start we're, a newsletter. This dude did it in the fucking fifties, and he didn't even have the internet. Like, yeah, yeah. What it's the hell? Grassroots campaigns. After just one year, Bender shut down the IFSB for no apparent reason. In the final newsletter, Bender left this message. Quote, we advise those involved in saucer work, that's a funny way of putting it, <laughs> to please be cautious, end quote. Bender later confided that in September 1953, three men in black had given him the terrifying answer to the UFO mystery, which went on to have adverse effects on his personal life. Bender became ill. He actually didn't eat for three days. He would say nothing else of the experience. Three years later, an IFSB member, Gray Barker, wrote a book about it called They Knew Too Much About Flying Saucers. That one is more of a believable account. This dude started a group, and they silenced him. Mm. Yeah, sounds like he got pretty shook. Bender, he goes on to become the catalyst for the Men in Black conspiracy. Him being the real first to talk about it and have an audience for it, he becomes the figurehead for the MIB story. A few months after Bender's MIB experience, Edgar R. Jared, organizer of the Australian Flying Saucer Bureau, and Harold Fulton, head of civilian saucer investigation of New Zealand, received visits from these dark figures and subsequently shut down their own organizations. See, there's got to be places like this that still exist all over the world. We got to hit these places up. There's got to be groups. Do you think so? Other than just MUFON. Like, there's got to be groups all over the world. You got to find the smaller groups. Yeah. I went to a MUFON meeting when I was, like, 11. Did you? Did you? Yeah, my dad took me to one. <laughs> he would. <laughs> when I was, like, fucking 11, I had no idea what was going on. Sounds I had no amazing. clue. In his article, Gray Barker, My Friend, The Myth Maker, John C. Sherwood claims that in the 1960s at the age of 18, he cooperated when Barker told him to create a hoax, which he ended up getting published. It was about what Barker called, quote, black men, end quote. Three mysterious UFO inhabitants who silenced a UFO witness, Barker would go on to write many books about the paranormal and UFOs, including 1970's The Silver Bridge, which helped spread the story of the creature known as the Mothman. Although it seems Barker had only written of these stories to become famous and sell books. By the 1980s, the Journal of American Folklore had written of them in a long article. Just who the MIB were remained unclear. To ufologists and conspiracy theorists, they were enforcers for the quote, silence group, who were involved with international banking interests to stop technological advances of the human race. To others, they were alien beings, much like Richard Sharp Shaver's stories of quote, Darrow's. Now, I looked into Richard Sharp Shaver and his stories, and a lot of them were in these science fiction books, but he really believed that, and it's it's kind of a cross-section of a lot of things that we've talked about with Hollow Earth and underground beings and whatnot, but he believed that there were two races. One was kind of like a light being race that lived above ground on the Earth, and they were highly technologically advanced and there was a subset of this race called the Daros who lived in caverns and they had become almost animalistic they were very much against the human race and he fully believed in these things and believed that the Daros were again kind of evil entities that lived within the earth and would come out and evil things to humans it's a strange thing for somebody to come out of a cavern and put on a fedora and sunglasses. I'm thinking the same thing. Like, that's not even a sabotage to the human race. It's just kind of like a weird troll. At first, I was thinking that might be more realistic than some sort of secret government agency putting people up to it. If it was actually some alien. But yeah, like, I, I just, I don't know. I feel like it's a weird form of sabotage. Like, how much are you really getting done? Hushlings will return after this short message. Hi, I'm Ray, self-confessed bookworm, film addict, hermit, long-time depression sufferer, and caffeine fiend. 
In Not Before Coffee, I talk about everything from books, TV and movies to the more serious topics, like my own personal journey through life, struggling with various mental health issues. But not until I've had at least three mugs of the roasted bean and temporarily sated my long-term addiction. So, if you want to get to know more about me and all the ways I pass my time during the week, not including work, and you fancy the idea of hearing me talk about the things that interest me, new books, old books, TV and movies of all kinds, plus the weird and wonderful of my everyday, and how I got into writing about cars for a living despite not having a driving licence, then tune in to Not Before Coffee. Found where all good podcasts are, so pretty much everywhere. In a world filled with COVID and chaos, three dads bring to you a riot of entertainment every hump day. Hump day? We are Jordan, a.k.a. The Gnome. Josh, a.k.a. The Dome. AJ, a.k.a. The Stone. And together, we're dads on Dayquil. Between the three of us, we have ten kids. (laughs) That we know about. (laughs) We're talking about you, Johnny Six. Mm. Sit down, turn up the volume, and crack a cold one as we bring you a glimpse into our dad lives. We break down our weekly events with our dad stories and tons of shout outs. Dad Corner. We bring you dad games. We also cover music, movies, and all things entertainment. Hell, we even bring you the Stone Safe House for off the wall references. Heyo! So come check us out on your favorite podcast platform even if you prefer certain platforms that we don't. Yeah, we're talking about you, Google Podcasts. Me, 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 me. Dad's out. Welcome back to the Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour. If you're a secret organization within the government that doesn't exist, not even like the CIA, I mean, the CIA exists. We're almost talking about similar circumstances to Area 51. It's there, but it's not. Yeah. If this organization does exist and it's completely black project, you'll never find out if these are human beings that could be manipulated. I mean, we definitely have the technology. I definitely, you know, have a way to manipulate people, whether it's with drugs or we've talked about that before. These could just be seriously black project agents that are doing this or it'd be a little bit more interesting if they were actually ultra dimensional or ultra terrestrial or just basically telling people to piss off on their business that's another thing if you look at the description of these men in black they're pale and hairless and they're kind of awkward and their mannerisms and the way that they speak and the way that they act and move it comes across very much like something or someone that is not comfortable within their own skin so we're talking draconian reptilian lizard people maybe not even reptilian but if you if you look at the description pale and then look at what shavers stories of the daros race looks like underground beings hanging out in caves and not really feeling comfortable as being human like i guess obviously shaver believed in these things but he also submitted these stories to sci-fi magazines and comics so how seriously do you take him and how seriously do you take the mythos surrounding the daros but is it possible with talk of ufos coming out of the ocean or ufos coming out of these large bore holes in antarctica is it possible that there is an alien race that lives within the earth and maybe these guys are coming out and they're silencing any witnesses I think it's possible, and if that is the case, do you think they're doing it on their own accord to justify their own means, or do you think they're working with some sort of covert government group that's having them do this? I got another question about it, though. Do you think, and this is a little bit not really off topic, but do you think Shaver's accounts of not being comfortable in their own skin, kind of like some of those, those descriptions of that, actually was subtly written in not even subtly more or less written into the men in black series with the first movie with the guy who gets the bug goes in him 
you know, sugar mm. water, you know, like <laughs> the dude's yeah. face, you know, like he's talking to people and he's got to pull his face back. I'm wondering that I didn't didn't look that up, but I'm wondering if a Richard Sharp Shaver's accounts actually fueled some of the writing in, in the actual pop culture movies. I think it's a common thread among stories like that when you have an alien race or some sort of alien being that is trying to be humanoid they don't know how to act they don't know how to move like a human how to talk like a human so they are making it up as they go (laughs) or mimicking as best as they can which is why they don't according to the to the descriptions they don't have expressions because if you don't know how to be human how do you know what expressions you should be making or if you should be making expressions? And that brings it back to the whole laughing at inappropriate times or, you know. In 1962, Bender broke his nine-year silence in Flying Saucers and the Three Men, which he insisted was not a science fiction novel. Bender revealed that the men in black who drove him out of ufology were monsters from the planet Kazakh. Even Barker the book's publisher said privately that maybe it had all been a dream oh man see that's interesting also because as we said barker seems to have been a publisher of these books and stories solely to sell books and make money but he backed bender in a lot of bender's stories so for him to go behind his back and kind of say this might not have been real this might have been just something that he came up with in his head who knows and after a nine-year silence from bender in those nine years he had thought about the men in black thought about what he was researching and who knows maybe maybe it it drove him nuts it could all just be just just pure fucking schizophrenia fucking yeah just it's just padded room type shit yeah just chaos that your mind had fallen into over those years of dealing with the men in black (laughs) or finding out the the mystery of the ufos as he had said let's get into some some men in black appearances what do you say September 11th, 1976. A physician, Dr. Herbert Hopkins, in Maine was studying a UFO encounter that had occurred months before. Hopkins received a phone call from someone claiming to be from the New Jersey UFO organization. The man asked if Hopkins was alone and wanted to discuss what he had found in his research of the incident. He asked Hopkins if he could come by, and the doctor agreed. The man said he would be right there. Moments later, the man was climbing front porch steps towards the house. Keep in mind, this was before cell phones, and the nearest house was not close enough for the man to already be there. Hopkins invited the man inside and immediately noticed his features. He was tall, thin, and pale, wearing a black suit and a black hat. He had no hair anywhere on his body, including eyebrows. How did he know that? I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> Hopkins noticed <laughs> Hopkins noticed the man had no lips. The man then told him to remove a coin from his pocket. The color of the coin changed from copper to silver and eventually disappeared. He told Hopkins if he had not stopped his investigation, he would end up like this coin. The man left and a bright flash of light in the sky was seen outside Hopkins' house moments after. That's one hell of a threat. I'm gonna make you disappear like this coin. Make you disappear, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's like a crazy. fucking murderous, angry magician. Sounds like the mob. Even up until this point, everybody that has said that they've had encounters with these people have been not like loony people. No. Herbert Hopkins was a doctor. And you have all these people that I guess hadn't really, it wouldn't really have a reason for making stuff up like this. You have Barker and his stories and what he was telling, but I don't know. For, for a doctor, a physician to go into this much detail involving a random man that came by his house, I don't know. I don't know why he would make it up. That's, that's my only thought on that. That always gets me when reputable people come out. When they literally have nothing to gain. Back then, you're a doctor. Like, you're probably making pretty good money, and you're not going to make money off of something like this. A newspaper company might make money, but you're not. For the Bob Lazar situation, man. Yeah, exactly. Howard Menger, an early UFO contactee, had said he had been inside of a flying saucer and spoke with aliens. In 1957, while he was living in Highbridge, New Jersey... Two men in black business suits showed up at his home. They claimed to be agents from a government bureau. 
They warned Menger to stop talking about UFOs and to cease his research. Consistency. In 1965, Rex Heflin of Oregon had taken very interesting photos of a UFO. Days later, he was visited by a man showing credentials from NORAD. See, this is the first time we hear of an actual organization. Mm -hmm. The investigator demanded all the original photos and film from Heflin. They were returned years later in his mailbox. To this day, analysts believe Heflin's photos to be among the most credible ever taken. Dude, they they gave him back. Yeah. (laughs) What? Years later, it just shows up in his mailbox. That's odd. That's super strange. That doesn't sound anything that like the U.S. government would do. That sounds like something completely outside. In April 1966, two schoolboys in Norwalk, Connecticut, were pursued by a low-flying saucer. The next day, a man appeared at their school. He told the principal he belonged to a government agency so secret he could not give a name. He questioned the boys for three hours. That is all just super f- sus, man. I don't, I don't like that. As a principal of a school, how do you not go, uh, okay, I still need to see ID, you're in a school, (laughs) and you're coming to talk to children? I don't, dude, it's the 60s, it's, it's before all of these fucking shootings. I don't know if they were that tight on security. We gotta ask our parents. If you, if you just said you were from the government, I don't know, some bozo principal might let you have two kids alone for like three hours in the 60s. Well, it's kind of like the local sheriff. Everybody's like, well, I gotta go take uh, Jimmy and uh, Sally for, uh, I gotta take them to school. Oh, no, it's fine. We, we, tr- we trust them. It's in Norwalk. We know what Norwalk is. Norwalk is a pretty rich, tight-knit community outside of Stamford. In 2008, Two dark-figured men were caught on CCTV entering a hotel in Ontario, Canada, where an employee had mentioned witnessing increased UFO activity above the hotel. They appeared tall and thin, had the same build, same features, and were dressed all in black, almost like identical twins. They asked to speak with the employee who had mentioned UFOs. Then, they began questioning the other staff members about UFO sightings and other conspiracies. And that's the most recent sighting of them. And you can actually see the CCTV footage. I believe there's clips of it on YouTube. If not, you can just Google it. It is readily available. The footage was caught in 2008, but it was released in 2012. For some odd reason, for four years, that was kept out of the limelight. Mm. So I've seen other CCT footage. I believe it was Seattle, Washington. It was somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. It wasn't in Canada, but it was two guys exactly the same way it's described. I don't know what type of business it was, but the girl that's sitting behind the desk goes for a gun and then she just stops. And they talked, it looks like they're talking to her, but their mouths aren't moving. I mean, it's CCTV, it's not the best. But she just ends up after like two minutes on talking with them, she ends up leaving with them. And one of the other employees is just kind of like dumbstruck of what just happened. I don't remember where I saw that. I think it was on like one of those UFO documentaries on Hulu or Netflix or it might have been YouTube, but it was super strange, but it was the exact type of yeah. description of them. They didn't move. They didn't say anything, but it was almost like they were controlling her because she pointed a gun at them. Yeah, I remember that video. Not Yeah, now that you're mentioning it. The, you know what the, I'm talking about? Gun. Yeah. Yeah, that was a super weird video. I think it was like Portland or Seattle. Yeah, I, I remember one of those that now. Yeah, day. you can look that up also. Was it like just the three or four of them in the in the video or were there like customers there and shit? Yeah, no, it was just them. She was like at the front really? desk or no, something. No, nobody else. It, it was like an insurance place or a bail bondsman place. It was it was like a weird, small, small business. I can't help but be skeptical about CCTV shit. Just because you never know, it, staged. Yeah, dude, it's yeah. so easy to fake. When when you see the traffic light cameras and shit like that, that's not so easy to fake because you can't just go grab the footage. I'm always skeptical about shit like that, but I want to look into those videos. I haven't seen them. I would suggest anyone out there that is interested in the sightings of the Men in Black to see if you can dig up any other videos. Besides these two incidents, I haven't really heard of any other footage of the Men in Black. There's always descriptions, there's always first-hand accounts, quote-unquote, but to to really find footage, I'd be super interested to see if there's more out there, especially in a, in a more technological world that we live in now. It's kind of hard to avoid being 
seen by cameras, especially in public. It really makes me wonder if there are more, there's more video out there of them. These are just a few of many encounters with these dark suited entities. In recent years, the sightings and reports of these MIB has actually declined. Whether it be due to them not appearing or them moving in increased stealth is unknown. Some reports suggest these men could be aliens working in unison with world governments. Others suggest these are nothing more than men working for a government entity or agency. I'm interested in your take on it. I'm obviously interested in our Hushling's take on what these men or people could be. But what what do you guys think they could be? Do you think that the Men in Black story and mythos is real? Or is this just copycat stories of Albert Bender's account? I'd have to go with copycat stories. I don't know if I could put my faith in it. Like you said, it's so hard. It's so fucking hard to stay out of the view of cameras, especially in today's society. Even if you're out in the middle of nowhere, there's drones flying constantly. With there only being two CCTV accounts that we know of, and you know some of these stories, I I just don't know if they they don't hold up for me, in my opinion. Yeah, that's just my take on it. I'd say, well, Bender was what fifty in fifty two. And a lot of this surfaced in a couple years before the five years before that. So I would say if Bender's doing this in 52 and then you have somebody in the, the 60s trying to make money off it, I'd say copycat there. But when you have things like Herbert Hopkins account, that's strange. That's very strange. And then when you have what was published in the 1980s with the Journal of American Folklore, they had written it with Richard Sharp Shaver's accounts. It's like coming in from a different angle. And then we go back and forth a little bit. We go to 57 with Menger and 65 with Rex Heflin. And he mentions NORAD. I would say that guy's account is probably not valid at all because no organization is ever mentioned i'd say the most compelling is probably the cctv like whether it's the one in 2008 in canada or the one that we were talking about that we didn't know exactly where it was those are the most compelling where you have the weirdest behavior whether somebody's wearing a suit and a fedora and sunglasses that's different i'm not even trying to say that they're definitely fake mind you i haven't seen the videos i'm just saying it's only those two and it's definitely easy to hoax you know shit like that you have easy accessibility to the actual like recording system i'm definitely gonna have to check it out to like make a final decision on that i think all in all i'm really on the fence i think they could 100 percent be a government agency that you don't know about Mm mm-hmm or they could 100% be ultra-dimensional or ultra-terrestrial. A group of extraterrestrials, whether it be could, could be could be lizard people or <laughs> yeah. something that we don't even know about that shapeshifts and looks exactly like a human being or settles within some type of human flesh embodiment. I'm on the fence with it. I, it, it could be one or the other. There's not enough physical evidence. There's just word of mouth, mm. but the consistency is compelling so hard to say what's said to be their whole entire goal is to essentially cover shit up keep mm-hmm. people quiet e- even with doll's case possibly even dispose of evidence disregard paper trails it's almost frightening because if the men in black are real then there's a whole lot of shit going on that nobody knows about but I- on the other side of my head i'm thinking if they are and what what has slipped through is just that shit that slipped through you know roswell for example you would hope if if this was a real organization they'd be damn good at what they do and that wouldn't get out i'm gonna take an opposite stance on this from you guys i believe that they are real my reasoning kind of goes into a little more research that i had done but before i mention that we talk about how albert k bender was the first real mention of the men in black but Ultimately, he wasn't, and and you can't really take all the accounts that follow as copycat. Maybe some of them are, but really where this whole thing starts, as far as recorded history goes, is 1947. It starts with Harold Dahl and Fred Christman. It starts with that story. So even before Bender's story comes into the limelight, Harold Dahl is talking about a man visiting him in a black suit coming to say, you didn't see anything, you're not telling anybody about this. So is it Harold Dahl maybe got visited by an actual 
FBI agent or an actual government bureau agent. And Bender's story is an exaggeration of that same kind of story. Or did Harold Dahl and Chrisman get visited by an actual Men in Black before they were brought to limelight. The other side of it is something that I saw within the research is that a lot of people look at the Men in Black and their stories and where they show up appearing within the last hundred years. The golden time of UFOs and extraterrestrials and where the story starts in, in Roswell and bring us to current day where we're getting, <laughs> you know, disclosure of the existence of aliens. But it goes beyond that. There's a small mention of during the Middle Ages. During the Middle Ages, there were accounts of men that would travel around and silence people who had seen, and at the time, this is what they called them, quote, visions of God in the sky. And these men would come around in black robes and black hats. They would come around and they would tell the people that it was not God that they had seen and that they would they should stop telling their story. Maybe we're looking at it as 1947 is the first story. Maybe we're looking at it as, as Roswell is the first mention of extraterrestrials and that's where we start our written and visual history of extraterrestrials. So maybe that's where we pick up that story, but the story goes back much further. You look at paintings that were done during the Renaissance. You look at uh, accounts in in the Bible. You know, not not jump into that too much, but you look at accounts written of fire in the sky, chariots of the gods. Von Daniken talks about it. Yeah. I think the history of extraterrestrials and UFOs as a whole, and even as it seems, maybe even the Men in Black, goes back a lot further than we imagine it did. Yeah, absolutely. We look at it as a modern thing with science fiction. Mm -hmm. I, obviously, I know that I know the paintings you're talking about, and you could go not only in the Bible, but you can go into other religious texts and see similarities. And David Childress, get on here. <laughs> you know, this is turning into an Ancient Aliens episode, but you can see you can see a similarities with that stuff, and it's hard not to question it. Well, Hushlings, that is the end of Debriefing 15, The Men in Black. You can join us in two weeks for Debriefing, you guessed it, Sweet 16. Mm. Guys, it's our Sweet 16. So sweet. Yo. This one is the Vethelsberg, or more commonly known as Wolfenstein Castle. This is a fun one for all of us, since we're all nerds and love video games. It'll be a fucking blast. I'm hyped. And Hushlings, don't forget to hit that subscribe button on our Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour YouTube, where we have the declassified discussions, where we go into the paranormal UFO accounts with other Hushlings, as well as our Cryptid Chronicles. Stay tuned for episode two coming shortly. Hushlings, we here at the Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour greatly appreciate your feedback and we love it when you guys leave reviews and your thoughts and comments on our podcast, whether it be on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or YouTube, wherever you're listening. Just leave a comment, leave a review. We greatly appreciate it. And don't forget to join us for our 20th episode, March 29th, which is L-I-V-E. Live. 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 Well, Hushlings, stare into my Neuralizer and beep. I'm Declassified Dave. And I'm Mystery Mike. And I'm Slick Frank Sanders. Thanks for joining us on the Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour. One day they'll knock on your door, one day they'll knock Until on your door. Until our next debriefing, remember, the best kept secrets are hidden in plain sight.